thereby saving the theater manager a salary and a suit of armor. Dunois's face, still on record at Chateau d'An, is a suggestive help, but I really know no more about these men and their circle than Shakespeare knew about Falconbridge and the Duke of Austria, or about Macbeth and Macduff. In view of things they did in history, and have to do again in the play, I can only invent appropriate characters for them in Shakespeare's manner. Avoid in the Elizabethan drama. I have, however, one advantage over the Elizabethans. I write in full view of the Middle Ages, which may be said to have been rediscovered in the middle of the 19th century after an eclipse of about 450 years. The renaissance of antique literature and art in the 16th century and the lusty growth of capitalism between them buried the Middle Ages, and their resurrection is a second renaissance. Now there is not a breath of medieval atmosphere in Shakespeare's histories. His John of Gaunt is like a study of the old age of Drake. Although he was a Catholic by family tradition, his figures are all intensely Protestant, individualist, skeptical, self-centered in everything but their love affairs, and completely personal and selfish even in them. His kings are not statesmen, his cardinals have no religion, a novice can read his plays from one end to the other without learning that the world is finally governed by forces expressing themselves in religions and laws which make epochs rather than by vulgarly ambitious individuals who make rows. The divinity which shapes our ends, rough-hew them how we will, is mentioned fatalistically, only to be forgotten immediately, like a passing vague apprehension. To Shakespeare, as to Mark Twain, Couchon would have been a tyrant and a bully instead of a Catholic, and the inquisitor Lemaitre would have been a sadist instead of a lawyer. Warwick would have had no more feudal quality than his successor the Kingmaker has in the play of Henry the Sixth. We should have seen them all completely satisfied that if they would only to their own selves be true, they could not then be false to any man, a precept which represents the reaction against medievalism at its intensest, as if they were beings in the air without public responsibilities of any kind. All Shakespeare's characters are so. That is why they seem natural to our middle classes, who are comfortable and irresponsible at other people's expense, and are neither ashamed of that condition nor even conscious of it. Nature abhors this vacuum in Shakespeare, and I have taken care to let the medieval atmosphere blow through my play freely. Those who see it performed will not mistake the startling event it records for a mere personal accident. They will have before them not only the visible and human puppets, but the church, the inquisition, the feudal system, with divine inspiration always beating against their two inelastic limits, all more terrible in their dramatic force than any of the little mortal figures clanking about in plate armor or moving silently in the frocks and hoods of the Order of St. Dominic. Tragedy, not melodrama. There are no villains in the piece. Crime, like disease, is not interesting. It is something to be done away with by general consent, and that is all about it. It is what men do at their best, with good intentions, and what normal men and women find that they must and will do in spite of their intentions, that really concerns us. The rascally bishop and the cruel inquisitor of Mark Twain and Andrew Lang are as dull as pickpockets, and they reduce Joan to the level of the even less interesting person whose pocket is picked. I have represented both of them as capable and eloquent exponents of the church militant and the church litigant, because only by doing so can I maintain my drama on the level of high tragedy and save it from becoming a mere police court sensation. A villain in a play can never be anything more than a diabolus ex machina, possibly a more exciting expedient than a deus ex machina, but both equally mechanical and therefore interesting only as mechanism. It is, I repeat, what normally innocent people do that concerns us, and if Joan had not been burnt by normally innocent people in the energy of their righteousness, 
her death at their hands would have no more significance than the tokyo earthquake which burnt a great many maidens the tragedy of such murders is that they are not committed by murderers they are judicial murders pious murders and this contradiction at once brings an element of comedy into the tragedy the angels may weep at the murder but the gods laugh at the murderers the inevitable flatteries of tragedy here then we have a reason why my drama of st joan's career though it may give the essential truth of it gives an inexact picture of some accidental facts it goes almost without saying that the old jean d'arc melodramas reducing everything to a conflict of villain and hero or in joan's case villain and heroine not only miss the point entirely but falsify the characters making cochon a scoundrel joan a prima donna and dunois a lover but the writer of high tragedy and comedy aiming at the innermost attainable truth must needs flatter cochon nearly as much as the melodramatist vilifies him although there is as far as i have been able to discover nothing against cochon that convicts him of bad faith or exceptional severity in his judicial relations with joan or of as much anti-prisoner pro-police class and sectarian bias as we now take for granted in our own courts yet there is hardly more warrant for glassing him as a great catholic churchman completely proof against the passions roused by the temporal situation neither does the inquisitor lemaitre in such scanty accounts of him as are now recoverable appear quite so able a master of his duties and of the case before him as i have given him credit for being but it is the business of the stage to make its figures more intelligible to themselves than they would be in real life for by no other means can they be made intelligible to the audience and in this case cochon and lemaitre have made intelligible not only themselves but the church and the inquisition just as warwick has to make the feudal system intelligible the three between them having thus to make a twentieth-century audience conscious of an epoch fundamentally different from its own obviously the real cochon lemaitre and warwick could not have done this they were part of the middle ages themselves and therefore as unconscious of its peculiarities as of the atomic formula of the air they breathed but the play would be unintelligible if i had not endowed them with enough of this consciousness to enable them to explain their attitude to the twentieth century all i claim is that by this inevitable sacrifice of verisimilitude i have secured in the only possible way sufficient veracity to justify me in claiming that as far as i can gather from the available documentation and from such powers of divination as i possess the things i represent these three exponents of the drama as saying are the things they actually would have said if they had known what they were really doing and beyond this neither drama nor history can go in my hands some well-meant proposals for the improvement of the play i have to thank several critics on both sides of the atlantic including some whose admiration for my play is most generously enthusiastic for their heartfelt instructions as to how it can be improved they point out that by the excision of the epilogue and all the references to such undramatic and tedious matters as the church the feudal system the inquisition the theory of heresy and so forth all of which they point out would be ruthlessly blue penciled by any experienced manager the play could be considerably shortened i think they are mistaken the experienced knights of the blue pencil having saved an hour and a half by disemboweling the play would at once proceed to waste two hours in building elaborate scenery having real water in the river loire and a real bridge across it and staging an obviously sham fight for possession of it with the victorious french led by joan on a real horse the coronation would eclipse all previous theatrical displays, showing first the procession through the streets of Reims, and then the service in the cathedral, with special music written for both. 
Joan would be burnt on the stage, as Mr. Matheson Lang always is in The Wandering Jew, on the principle that it does not matter in the least why a woman is burnt, provided she is burnt, and people can pay to see it done. The intervals between the acts, whilst these splendors were being built up, and then demolished by the stage carpenters, would seem eternal, to the great profit of the refreshment bars, and the weary and demoralized audience would lose their last trains and curse me for writing such inordinately long and intolerably dreary and meaningless plays. But the applause of the press would be unanimous. Nobody who knows the stage history of Shakespeare will doubt that this is what would happen if I knew my business so little as to listen to these well-intentioned but disastrous counsellors. Indeed, it probably will happen when I am no longer in control of the performing rights. So perhaps it will be as well for the public to see the play while I am still alive. The Epilogue As to the epilogue, I could hardly be expected to stultify myself by implying that Joan's history in the world ended unhappily with her execution, instead of beginning there. It was necessary, by hook or crook, to show the canonized Joan as well as the incinerated one. For many a woman has got herself burnt by carelessly whisking a muslin skirt into the drawing-room fireplace, but getting canonized is a different matter, and a more important one. So I am afraid the epilogue must stand. To the critics, lest they should feel ignored. To a professional critic, I have been one myself, Theatre-going is the curse of Adam. The play is the evil he is paid to endure in the sweat of his brow, and the sooner it is over, the better. This would seem to place him in irreconcilable opposition to the paying playgoer, from whose point of view, the longer the play, the more entertainment he gets for his money. It does, in fact, so place him, especially in the provinces where the playgoer goes to the theater for the sake of the play solely and insists so effectively on a certain number of hours' entertainment that touring managers are sometimes seriously embarrassed by the brevity of the London plays they have to deal in. For in London the critics are reinforced by a considerable body of persons who go to the theater as many others go to church, to display their best clothes and compare them with other people's, to be in the fashion and have something to talk about at dinner parties, to adore a pet performer, to pass the evening anywhere rather than at home, in short, for any or every reason except interest in dramatic art as such. In fashionable centers, the number of irreligious people who go to church, of unmusical people who go to concerts and operas, and of undramatic people who go to the theater, is so prodigious that sermons have been cut down to ten minutes and plays to two hours, and even at that congregations sit longing for the benediction and audiences for the final curtain, so that they may get away to the lunch or supper they really crave for, after arriving as late as, or later than, the hour of beginning can possibly be made for them. Thus from the stalls and in the press an atmosphere of hypocrisy spreads. Nobody says straight out that genuine drama is a tedious nuisance, and that to ask people to endure more than two hours of it, with two long intervals of relief, is an intolerable imposition. Nobody says, I hate classical tragedy and comedy, as I hate sermons and symphonies, but I like police news and divorce news and any kind of dancing or decoration that has an aphrodisiac effect on me or on my wife or husband. And whatever superior people may pretend, I cannot associate pleasure with any sort of intellectual activity, and I don't believe anybody else can either. Such things are not said. Yet nine-tenths of what is offered as criticism of the drama in the metropolitan press of Europe and America is nothing but a muddled paraphrase of it. If it does not mean that, it means nothing. I do not complain of this, though it complains very reasonably of me, but I can take no more notice of it than Einstein of the people who are incapable of mathematics. 
I write in the classical manner for those who pay for admission to a theater because they like classical comedy or tragedy for its own sake, and like it so much when it is good of its kind and well done, that they tear themselves away from it with reluctance to catch the very latest train or omnibus that will take them home. Far from arriving late from an eight or half-past eight o'clock dinner, so as to escape at least the first half-hour of the performance, they stand in queues outside.